Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening's webinar, Strategies to Help Students Learn Vocabulary, with French teacher and author Dervla Murphy. Dervla is obviously a very experienced French teacher. She has also lectured um, in UCD um, French methods on the UCD PME course. She supported teachers as a PDST MFL associate um, and has done some examining as well. In addition to all of that, you, she may be best known to some of you as the author of our Leaving Cert programme, Tu vas bien, um, or indeed as the author of Tous Ensemble, Folin's Junior Cycle French programme. You may have known all that already. What you may not know is that Tous Ensemble now offers you the flexibility to choose between a two book series and a single book option for the three years of Junior Cycle. My name is Clodagh Quinn. I'm a commissioning editor at Folins and I'll start by giving you a brief overview of the format of this evening's webinar so you know what to expect. So tonight Dervla is going to talk for in and around 35-40 minutes and she will look specifically at ways to boost student vocabulary acquisition through using um, a variety of different strategies. So activating prior knowledge, looking at receptive versus productive vocabulary learning, looking at some digital tools, looking at sentence builders as a tool uh, and recycling and revisiting vocabulary. And then at the end, we will have an opportunity for you to ask some questions, which you can do by putting them just into the chat feature. And I will keep an eye on those and I'll relay those questions to Dervla. Um, and we will aim uh, to wrap up the session in and around eight o'clock approximately. So without further ado, I will hand over to Dervla Murphy. Hi, good evening. Um, I suppose I'd like to start by saying thank you so much for uh, joining in this evening. I know it's a very, very busy time of year for MFL teachers between the CBAs at Junior Cycle and also then getting our um, senior level students ready for their orals over Easter. So I hope tonight is going to be, um, hope it's going to be lively. I hope it's going to be engaging and I hope it will teach you something new um, or reconfirm the best practice that you are already doing. So I suppose, you know, before starting any sort of uh, talk, it's really important to face up to the, the realities of teaching, you know, in Ireland. Um, I happen to teach in an all girls school. I have taught mixed before. Um, and I know that people joining in tonight, you know, you your teaching, your kind of school can be very different from, um, you know, another person down the road. But at the end of the day, we do share, you know, some of the, the same challenges. So really, when I think about what are the challenges for me um, teaching vocabulary, it really boils down to these four things. So, you know, the first thing, and we, we can't really get away from it, is we have large classes at uh, Junior Cycle, you know. Um, some of us have 28, some of us have 28 plus. So how do we motivate, you know, all these young learners of varying abilities to continually learn and revise vocab. So really for me, that's, you know, the main challenge. I can't just have my 10 or 12 eager learners. You know, I have to bring everyone on board this vocab journey. The next thing is keeping those learners engaged and on task. Um, and I suppose we'll talk a little bit about, you know, through the webinar, kind of how do we do that? How do we make sure that, you know, we're reaching the 28 and not just the, the couple of people in the class? Um, I suppose I'm showing my age here, but, um, you know, I've been teaching in Irish schools for coming up now on 20 years and Every generation is different. Every generation comes with, you know, um, positives, comes with, you know, highlights, but also comes with challenges. And for me, um, you know, I'm going to call maybe like the last couple of first year intakes that I've had. I kind of call them the, the TikTok generation and um, very different from the way I grow up, very different from the way I suppose I was exposed to uh, French um, in uh, secondary school. But the reality is the young people that I'm teaching, the young people that I'm welcoming into my language class, they are very, very different. They're different in how they consume media. They're different in how they learn, how they revise. And that's something I suppose as language teachers, you know, we're, we're faced with this, you know, whether we are starting out now, um, you know, in 10, year in 10 years time, the learners are going to be uh, different. You know, if we have 
a long career, we're looking back and we're kind of thinking of, you know, the different trends, the different type of generations. So certainly the one we have now, the TikTok generation, you know, it comes down to concentration and it can be hard to, you know, engage them and to make sure that their focus is on the, the task at hand when it comes to vocabulary. And then the last challenge that I find, and this is something that I suppose is very new to the new, uh, well, it's not new anymore, but new to a junior cycle, is that there is an onus on our students to work independently and self-reflect. And I mean, this really comes to the heart of the common level paper. It's there for varying um, students of varying abilities. So we have to urge those students to kind of, I suppose, take ownership of their learning, to reflect on their progress and to see how they can improve their language skills, as opposed to kind of the teacher just doing, you know, blanket, trying to bring the whole uh, class along. Some of our students are, are great at working independently, others less so. And that language of reflection, of self-reflection, something that, you know, we really need to start teaching and putting in there from first year. So I suppose, you know, that's kind of, some of the main challenges that I see on a day to day basis um, in my classroom, you know, from giving workshops, this would be also information that is kind of fed uh, back to me. So when it comes to the strategies, um, I suppose it's very important that, you know, we have a different generation, a different style of learner, and we need to use a range of different strategies in our teaching, learning and assessment. So we need some dedicated strategies, but whatever we use, mixing it up, having fun, getting them involved in active learning, that is absolutely the key to helping students learn vocabulary. Um, I identified five different strategies that I like to use. I use them in rotation um, and I really find that by using these, I can get my learners, you know, to just engage more with the vocabulary and also not see it as such a, a burden as perhaps they did in the past. So I'd be looking at activating prior knowledge receptive and productive vocabulary learning, digital tools, the use of sentence builders, and then recycling and revisiting vocabulary. So, you know, if you're just out of your PME, these are all things you're very familiar with, and um, perhaps you know some of them, perhaps um, some of them are things that you're using um, quite a lot in class, but certainly I would urge you to kind of keep an open mind and to have a look at how using them together can really strengthen um, our learners and how um, they manage their second language uh, acquisition. So when it comes to the first one, activating um, prior knowledge, you know, certainly um, when I was growing up and, and I was learning French, for me, um, vocab tests were very much, you know, the teacher opened the book, pointed to the section of vocab, and there could have been 15, you know, 20 words there. They were set for learning you know, and you had to go and then do a test on them the, the following day or the following week. And that kind of old school style of, of vocab tests, it does, I suppose, reward our learners that are very good at rote learning. But unfortunately, it doesn't ensure that those good rote learners are going to be able to use them in context. And also for our Learners who perhaps are, struggle a little bit more with that style of learning, it doesn't really reward them. It doesn't allow them to see that they're making progress uh, in the language. So by using this technique of activating prior knowledge, we're kind of encouraging all of our learners to engage with the vocab um, and this is going to help it to help them to kind of commit it to their long-term memory better. So what is this technique? So it's a technique where students are encouraged to revisit what they already know about a topic before they are taught new information. There's lots of different little techniques that we can use. Um, you can do it through texts or listening, but you can also do it where the students are actively engaged. Um, I like to use, you know, the, I suppose the, the old chestnut, the, the brainstorming, the mind maps being more visual, the KWL charts or an anticipation guide. And what are the benefits that I've seen, I suppose, from, from using this activation of prior knowledge? Well, I remember one time I did a little survey uh, with my, I think it was my second years, you know, and I said, what are the challenges 
of learning French. And one student said, it's just lots of new words, you know, every new chapter, new words, new words, new words, new words. And I suppose we're kind of seeing it like that. It's putting yourself back into their shoes and realizing, yes, you know, there are an awful lot of words, a lot of vocab, a lot of verbs to be learned. So how can we kind of break that down and show them that not every topic is starting from scratch, that they actually have prior knowledge, be it their world knowledge, be it their language skills, that they can take and make this new learning a little bit easier. So um, it's all about making connections. So the benefits I find in the classroom, um, it helps learners use their own personal, educational and cultural knowledge to connect new material to familiar concepts. Learners can use what they already know as the foundation for new ideas and learning. By revisiting prior knowledge, learners are improving their recalled learning and really, really fundamental. Students start to see connections between their past, current and future learning. So, for example, if we are um, starting a unit or starting a topic on les vacances, you know, we don't want our learners just coming to it thinking, well, we haven't studied this yet. You know, I know nothing about it. So by activating the prior knowledge, we're getting them to think, well, actually, you know, I've studied the different parts of France. I know how to say um, in Nice and Paris. Um, I also know how to talk about my family. So I'm going to go on holidays with my family. I also have learned the weather. So I'm probably going to be talking about, you know, weather vocabulary. And yeah, we, we actually, I think we did a little bit on, on transport. So you're getting them to see that even though it might be uh, a new topic, that they actually have lots of learning that is connected to this. And by getting them to either um, visually or orally explore those connections, it really is making everything much more manageable for them. So there's a couple of different ways. Um, I suppose the kind of old school one is the remue menage, uh, the brainstorm. So um, there's lots of, apologies, there's lots of different ways um, to do this. So I suppose one way to do it is, you know, um, to use a graphic organizer. And these are really great for getting students to categorize um, their knowledge. You can also do it, you know, in their copies, uh, if they're lucky enough to have the iPads. Mini whiteboards are a great way of doing this. Or, you know, sometimes if I kind of want to waken up the class, I do something called attack the board where I arm them with markers and they come up and they do a beautiful, a uh, big visual brainstorm on the board, which I'll take a, a picture of and then, uh, you know, uh, send it to them. So, you know, what are we doing? So I suppose whether you know, when we're working on vocab, we're asking them to think about the, the links, you know, so if it's the holidays, what have they already learned? What do they know? Or perhaps are there some words that are very similar in um, L1 into that also look uh, familiar in L2? Um, so we're asking them, I suppose, to activate um, their prior knowledge. And this is creating the foundation for, for what they're going to learn. Um, it's a nice way to differentiate if they're doing it in pairs. You could ask them to come up with, for example, um, a minimum of five words, or if you have like fast finishers, you know, could they go on, maybe let them use if, if they have iPads, you know, to, to maybe Google a few words um, and ask them to come up with 10, 10 or 15. So when we're talking about, I suppose, differentiation, you know, that's the type of way we want to differentiate by task. So everyone's working on the same thing, but it's, you know, quite easy to help perhaps our some of our weaker students and then for our fast finishers that we're, we're keeping them engaged. Um, so the brainstorm, I suppose, is, is through words. But if we want to take it to the next level, um, I would also start um, by introducing some, some mind maps. So sometimes I might brainstorm, other times I might use a mind map. And I suppose the difference with the mind map is it's visual. So your thoughts and ideas are displayed around a central concept or subject. And where I like the mind map is, for example, if, if students are studying um, the topic of travel or transport, 
um, they mightn't yet know the words for um, a plane, a boat, but what they can do is they could put in, for example, uh, the verb alley, which they know, and then they could draw. So they could actually draw in the train and the plane. And then as they go throughout the unit, you know, that's showing them that there's a reason behind needing to know um, these words. Um, another kind of popular one that I know a lot of people use are the KWL charts. And once again, you know, it's about mixing it up so I might do a brainstorm I might do a KWL chart you know I wouldn't always use exactly the same technique because if you use the same I find kind of the comes a little bit stale for the learners so you know we want to keep them guessing we want to keep them I suppose um, excited about what's coming next so the KWL chart is is very very simple Um, you can this one here I suppose is in English but you can put it into the target languages uh, if you want so you can do it individually you can do it in pairs you can do it as a whole class and I suppose you start by, you know, putting in the topic and what I know. So it's activating the prior knowledge, be that, um, you know, their, their vocab, um, be that their verbs, and they're putting it in the first column. And then what do they want to know? So they can have a discussion around, you know, maybe you could show them um, some of the activities or in like third year, show them some of the exam questions. So kind of getting them ready for what is expected of them. And then towards the end of the unit or the end of the lesson, writing down what I have learned. So with the KWL, it's really a practical way to keep learners motivated and curious about uh, the new learning. So whichever technique, I would just say, you know, it kind of just, uh, it's a little bit more exciting than just kind of, you know, saying new topic, here we go, you know, let's start again. It's it's asking them to, to really get involved. Um, the second thing that, that I like doing with students is, um, I suppose, getting them involved with their, their vocab learning. Um, you know, as I said, kind of in the past, we just had that kind of old school style of a vocab test. Here's 20 words, learn them. You know, I might have been sitting there going, why do I need to know the word for chimpanzee? Um, it didn't matter. It was in the book. It was set by the teacher, you know, and I had to learn it. So really with our new style of learners, you know, we are thinking of opportunities to to differentiate because we know our learners learn in different styles and with different paces. So by using receptive and productive vocabulary learning, we can help categorize vocab for our learners so it helps students cope with the learning overload or, or what they perceive to be as just a continual stream of new vocab so what i would do is you know at the start of first year or even again at the start of second year i would talk to them about vocab you know we would have a discussion about What's the best way of managing, organizing our vocab, revising our vocab, revisiting it? And one thing I would always talk to them is about receptive and productive. Now, if you want, you can call it, you know, must know or must recognize. It, it doesn't really matter, you know, the language you use if you want to put it into a more student friendly way. Um, but the idea is the same. The receptive vocab, they're the words that we want our students to be able to understand when they read or hear them. So that is for our listening and our reading. As we know, our listening uh, comprehension section and our reading section are both uh, the, the two equally the two highest scoring sections on the junior cycle paper. So it's obvious that our students are going to need to know much more receptive vocab than they are going to need productive vocab. Um, I'm thinking it's like 120, 120 and then 80 for productive. So the productive vocab, they're the words that we want our students to use when they are writing or talking. So Obviously, that is the vocab we want them to commit to their long term memory so that when they are um, doing a role play, when they're doing a portfolio piece, when they are writing um, assignments, that they're able to recall this vocabulary. So if we are encouraging them to think about the words, why we're asking them to learn them and what style of learning we're asking them to do, that can kind of make them see that, you know, actually, 
it's much more manageable. I don't have to learn to see, say, spell every single word that is in uh, the vocab section. So just to give an example from um, Toussaint Song. So certainly I know in the past when I've used textbooks, you know, there have been maybe 60, 70 uh, words, you know, per chapter marked as vocab. And, you know, I would feel overwhelmed uh, trying to teach that, let alone have the students learn it. So how I've done the vocab sections um, in Toussaint Sambe is really trying to make them uh, student friendly, be it really small things like having, for example, um, colour coded our um, indefinite articles so they know one is masculine, one is feminine. But also I would say to them that when we are looking at, you know, a topic, so for example, is animo domestique, I would say to them straight away, well, OK, if we were doing, for example, a formulaire and you have an exchange partner coming and, you know, you're asked to fill in what type of, of pets you have in the home. So I would say to students, you know, working in pairs, can we highlight, can we tick the type of pets that we might need to write about? So, you know, we're going to have our un chien, un chat, we might have a few lapins, we might have a few poissons rouges. But in reality, we're not necessarily going to have une peruche, une souris, une tortue. So I would say to the students straight away, OK, so what distinction? What are our must knows that we're going to produce? And what are our must understand that might come up, for example, in a reading comprehension, in a listening comprehension, if we were going online and reading something about animals? And that's showing them that it's making the vocab work for them, that instead of having to see, say, spell all of the words in the page, they're going to have to see, say and spell a small percentage and the rest they have to be able to recognise. And straight away, that takes the overwhelm, that takes the workload down a little bit and makes it more manageable. The same thing, for example, avec les animaux sauvages. So, you know, we would say, well, are we going to be talking about, you know, having un pingouin, un panda, un lion à la maison? Probably not. But we would say once again, well, you know, why do we need to know these? You know, so we might look at a text, we might go onto the WWF uh, page in French and see these animals. So once again, it's stressing the point, these are the ones that we need to uh, be able to recognise. Um, you know, when it comes to the vocab sections, get the students involved. You know, they absolutely love it be it by colour coding, be it by ticking, be it by highlighting, get them to write the words into their copies in groups, really, you know, ask them to make the words their own. Uh, that is so important. Um, so I suppose the third way that we, we help our students to um, learn is by tapping into the wonderful world of digital tools. So the first thing I would say is that, you know, as teachers, we probably don't have as good digital skills as our students. So never, ever be afraid of introducing a digital tool into the classroom because, you know, they really are the experts here. So why, you know, why do we use them? How do they enhance our, our teaching and in this case, our vocab learning? So I suppose the, the first way is that um, digital tools, they just make vocab learning fun. And also they, they tap into the, the style of learner that we have in front of us in the class. So when I talked about the, the TikTok generation um, a little bit earlier uh, in the presentation, I suppose, you know, if we kind of look into that in detail, studies have shown us that, um, you know, we are addicted to our phones. That is a, 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 a real thing. We have the word nomophobie in French, this, this panic of, of being without uh, the mobile. And just as this applies to adults, it you know, probably more so uh, applies to, to the uh, teens that we have in front of us. So when it comes to their, I suppose, concentration, you know, if we look at TikTok, um, I'm sure there's people there who adore TikTok. You could be content creators yourself. Maybe there's others who, um, you know, it's it's not really your cup of tea, but I suppose to kind of, you know, the essence of TikTok is that it is 30 seconds um, that the creator has to to get their message or to um, get their content across. So that 30 seconds, unfortunately, now we're seeing that in our students, that is really kind of the max for concentration. Um, so 
as that can be hard, but also it's something we can use to our advantage if we use a mix of digital tools that kind of, I suppose, in some way kind of reproduce that that colourful, that lively, that really kind of online connected world that they love to uh, tap into. Um, there's lots and lots of digital tools out there. Um, some of the ones that I love and I just, you know, keep on coming back to are Quizlet, Wordwall, Study Stack, Block It and Kahoot. Now, um, there, there exists, of course, you know, paid versions um, of these apps, but I'm going to put my hand up and say, you know, these are things that personally I, I wouldn't pay for. Um, I find that there is just enough, um, I suppose, user ability in the, the free app or in the free version of these apps that I don't really feel uh, the need to, you know, um, either subscribe myself or go and beg uh, the principal or the bursar uh, for a subscription. Um, and I suppose just to say as well, you know, when when writing the Tous Ensemble uh, series, um, you know, I really wanted to make it come alive. So for me, the Tous Ensemble series, you know, of course it is the textbook, the, the portfolio book, uh, the teacher's guide, but also, you know, alongside of that, nearly as important are the digital resources um, that the, the wonderful team uh, at Folans uh, helped me to develop for um, Folans Hive. So that, you know, whatever tool you're using, you know, I would always ask the question, you know, is it accessible? Is it suitable for the learner? And, you know, can they use it? Um, can, you know, can it be used in class? Maybe can it be used at home? Um, and what what does it give uh, to their learning? So this kind of brings me, I suppose, to uh, FOMO, the the fear of missing out. And you know, certainly, um, I would say even maybe up to three or four years ago, maybe maybe uh, up to kind of uh, COVID and lockdown, um, I had an awful fear of missing out, missing out on new digital tools, on you know new apps, new language apps. And really, when I asked myself why, it was because, you know, I've always had a great interest in um, using uh, digital tools to teach uh, MFL. I suppose that's one of my passions. That's one of the things I would kind of have always prided myself on. So I felt the need to continually use new apps and um, to use, use new websites to, I suppose, always be looking for, you know, the next best thing. Um, you know, if someone at a conference or something said, you know, oh, are you using Seesaw? You know, I would panic or using Edmodo. I would stop and go, you know, oh my goodness, I haven't. I'm going to have to go home. I'm going to have to try it. And in reality, what it meant was I was kind of app hopping quite a lot. And it meant that, you know, I was using an app maybe three or four times in the class. Maybe I'd use it for a month or two months. But then I was moving on to the next app. And really, when I thought about it, that was probably not really helping my learners get the best out of that app. It was more, as I say, my fear of missing out and wanting my learners to have the most up to date thing. Whereas in reality, it's about consistency. It doesn't really matter which one you use. Once you feel it fulfills, um, you know, its pedagogical need, stick with it. You know, maybe rotate between two and three. But really, um, you know, technology is always going to develop. There's always going to be the next app, the next great thing. Um, just as it goes, you know, a lot of these apps like, you know, Padlet, it's wonderful. We use it and then it goes behind um, a paywall. So, you know, these are all things to consider when we are using apps and, and choosing which ones to use. But really, you know, just use uh, three or four um, at max and really, really integrate them into the heart of your classroom. Your students will benefit from it academically and I suppose then kind of stress wise, uh, you know, it, it lessens the load for you. Um, as I say, always trying to keep up and uh, jump onto the next thing. Um, when it comes to apps, I suppose, you know, I have to say I'm very lucky to teach in a school where our learners are using iPads. Um, they are compulsory at a junior cycle and then they are optional at senior cycle. Um, 
I know that before the introduction of iPads, we kind of had um, a bring your own device. So students were allowed um, in some cases bring in a tablet or maybe, you know, bring in the phone. Obviously, it all had to be uh, very closely monitored. Um, but even before that, you know, I would have always asked my students, I suppose, to be, you know, looking into these things at home and um, I suppose we're you know lucky that quite a lot of our learners will have access to um, some type of digital device. So what I want to show here, you know, I know that not everyone is going to have access to it in the classroom. But I also know that the majority of teachers are, um, you know, teaching now through laptops and projectors. So the ideal is have the students using the apps, but if not, you know, having the teacher using them is also something that is, um, you know, very, very beneficial as well. Um, one that I like, and once again, this is the um, the free version, so I don't do anything behind the paywall, um, WordWall. So WordWall is a great app for getting students to engage with um, different uh, pieces of vocabulary. As you can see, the interface, you know, it's perfect for second, third year. You know, it's just really nice. It's very colourful and um, it's kind of quirky. Students can play lots of different games. You work on sets so you can create your own set or the teacher can search for sets as well. Um, and then when you have that set, you can learn it through the flashcards and then you can play games. So you can play this matching. You can do an anagram game. Um, a similar thing is study stack. It's perhaps not as visually appealing, but actually it's it's really, really good. So the same thing, we have our flashcards. You have uh, le français uh, on one side and then l'anglais sur l'autre côté. You've lots of different games you can play, be it matching, be it odd one out. And, you know, once again, it is just a really great way of just consolidating that vocabulary, you know, instead of asking students maybe just to go home and do the C say spell, ask them, you know, send them a link, ask them to play around with the set on study stack or on word wall. Another one that um, my students love is Quizlet Live. Um, once again, it's the same thing. We're working from flashcards. We can do matching games. Uh, what's good about Quizlet is they can hear the pronunciation of the word, and I do find that quite valuable. Um, but the real, I suppose, um, thing that the students love with Quizlet is the actual competition um, uh, side to it. So you can put up uh, the QR code or send them a link and then they can play in teams or individually and they see a picture and they have to do a multiple choice guess which is the correct word and they're trying to get to, uh, you know, a 10 first. If they get one wrong, the counter goes back, they can all see their progress and it leads to a lively uh, and a fun class. And, you know, it is, I always find if I really, really need them or I really want them to revise before a test, I always say, you know, five minutes of studying the set of words and then we'll play at uh, Quizlet live. Um, so, you know, there's ones that I use, I suppose, out on the net. Um, one set that I would use on a very, very regular basis, obviously, is with uh, the Tous Ensemble. So when you open up um, the book reader, if you go um, to the menu on the left hand side, um, what you will see for each of the chapters, there are um, a, a range of different um, digital uh, tools and digital uh, games that we can play. So just this one I have here just happens to be um, the chapter um, I have Chez Moi open. So you can see that there is like a, a poster game. So in the poster game when the students, so when you uh, click in, you can show the students on the board the map of Europe. They will hear the name of each country being uh, called out and then they have to try and uh, see can they choose the correct uh, country. And um, it's just using the vocab in context. It's just, I suppose, playing around with it, you know, and that little element of uh, competition. And um, the next thing that we have our monologues. So it's so important that when we are teaching the students the vocab, we have to show it to them in context. So the monologues are recordings done by authentic French speakers using the vocab that the students are asked to learn, you know, for a topic. You can uh, play the audio with or without uh, the subtitles there. And I find that these are really, really good for helping students build confidence in their spoken production. You can see that each one of them is accompanied by a student worksheet. So once again, it's, you know, asking them to focus in 
on the vocab and then you have the teacher worksheet as well to go with it. Um, I would use this as prep for portfolio tasks and also I find it really handy coming in um, to that CBA 1 or even CBA 2 prep um, to kind of show them real examples of um, the vocab that they are using they are learning being put into context um, the one that I just always come back to on uh, for Tous Ensemble on the digital side is bingo um, I don't if your learner is 12 your learner is 18 they just really seem to love a game of bingo um, so with the Tous Ensemble um, bingo app what you can do is for each of the chapters it will take the main vocab topics and then create um, a card so the card type depending on what you want to work with the students you can print out the cards with the words or you can print out the cards uh, with the pictures and uh, just that's an example there where you put in the amount of cards you need so you can put in 28 um, and it will generate 28 cards I tend to kind of just um, print them out and laminate them so that I you know I have them I have the sets ready to go um, and then when you start the bingo machine it has the lovely pronunciation you can choose to have the words and um, the words with audio or you can have um, obviously the pictures with the audio as well and I really find it's just you know a nice way to really consolidate um, that vocabulary and of course it's it's always a, a little bit of fun. Um, so I suppose um, kind of when we're thinking of um, you know vocab um, a lot of us, I suppose, you know, we kind of go online, like we follow on, on X, we follow different educators and, you know, a lot of people kind of when I'm at workshops or that, you know, they're saying to me, oh, you know, I've heard Gianfranco Conti, I've heard Steve Smith and, and they're talking about these, these sentence builders and, you know, I'd love to use them, but I'm not sure what they are. And I suppose when it comes to sentence builders, the first thing to say is like these predate <laughs> uh, social media. These have been around for, you know, a very, very long time. They have come back um, into fashion and it's probably one of the biggest changes uh, in my teaching um, in recent years. There's something there that I just absolutely um, could not do without. So sentence builders, you know, you can uh, make your own. You can go old school, you can do, you know, pen and paper, you can do them on the board um, you can find them online. Um, what I have done for Tous Ensemble is I have for every single chapter, um, I have developed or every single unit, should I say, unit of learning, I have developed um, sentence builders to help our students really get to grips with the vocabulary. Um, why do I use them? I suppose, first of all, just to present it. Um, Detailed sentence builders and, you know, a good sentence builder will allow your learners to work independently. Um, when it comes to CBA time, you know, we have that short window that, you know, that three weeks and it always seems to be the three weeks when the, the camogie finals or the, the football finals are on or, you know, things are happening and, you know, it, it can get quite stressful for teachers, you know, thinking, um, you know, it's a short window. How do I bring everyone along? Well, I would say that the sentence builders really come into their own here. Um, why do I use them? Well, I use them because they're useful in providing learners with the tools to successfully complete written and oral tasks. And this is coming back to the productive tasks, the ones that they have to write or speak themselves. So I love a sentence builder. It's a flexible resource. It is low prep, especially if you're using the ones uh, already in, in the ends of the, the uh, units, but they're highly um, adaptable and they allow learners to practice the five key skills. And I mean, I suppose that is, you know, the dream in a class, be it, you know, the 40 minute, even the hour, you know, it can be hard to get the different key skills in there. They're also a great way to build differentiation into lessons in the language classroom. Um, they're the differentiation I, I, I tend to favour. So I know kind of in the past we were more looking at, you know, oh, if we have fast finishers, here's your extra worksheet, here's your extra question. And sometimes that can have, you know, a, a knock on effect it can kind of knock the confidence of um, other learners, perhaps learners who struggle a little bit but by all using the same sentence builder but just in different ways you know it really helps us to differentiate um, in a very natural a very kind of subtle way in the class that are, is not going to upset um, our learners so 
Um, I suppose the first thing to say that, you know, when it comes to the sentence uh, builders, there are just so many ideas out there. And um, for that reason, in the teacher's guide that comes with the series, um, I have a beautiful double page, double page spread um, that really lists all the different type of ways, you know, that we can use them. So for listening, you know, the teacher can compose a sentence and then the students listening along can tick or put a little dot on the words they're hearing. You can also ask the students to construct a little, you know, mini little listening comprehension themselves from using it and then their partners write it down. For spoken production, um, it really helps the students to, you know, build up their little uh, role play. Um, you know, we could give them a, a picture and from that picture, ask them to use the sentence builder to, you know, build up a series of questions and answers that are going to be in their role play. I'm thinking about maybe like transport or travel. Um, for reading as well, you know, as a teacher, it's quite quickly that we could do a little gap fill um, using the vocab, using the different um, the different sections from the uh, sentence builder. Students can then use either have it um, if they want to, or maybe just try and do it themselves and see can they fill in uh, the gaps as they're reading. So just to kind of show you some of the examples of the sentence builders. So um, for me, the sentence builders, you know, they need to be very clear. So what I have done is I've kind of color coded them. So if I'm using a verb, it's going to be in blue. If I'm using like a preposition or a link word is going to be in green and um, my nouns are going to be in purple um, and I just kind of my adjectives are going to be in in the peach shade so it's also helping the learners see the different grammar patterns you know that go into constructing uh, their work when do I use them I use them in class for classwork they're great for pair or group work they're also good uh, for homework having them there to you know give the students the tools they need and for a revision sometimes students panic at revising you know a whole chapter, I would always direct them to um, the sentence builders to help them with that. Um, I suppose as teachers, you know, we're kind of thinking of different means of assessment. If you are giving a test, you know, maybe if you have a student who is really struggling or, you know, a student who is sick, who has missed work, you know, I would let them, I would let them do the assessment as an open book test and just have it on the sentence builder page so that, you know, they're having to make the connections for it and um, to be able to use the vocab in such a way that they can construct, um, you know, be it their, their written piece or their uh, spoken piece. Um, bringing it on then into second year and third year, you know, we use the sentence builders for the portfolio pieces for the tash clay in the book which are you know the real key exercises this i suppose is getting into exam practice um really great then for the cba prep and um, you know if they're doing a little cba um role play on you know someone booking accommodation um it's kind of helping them if they're trying to do you know if you're trying to prep for that question 18 in class which let's be honest 200 words to write is quite a lot and um, you know it's really great to show them you know that the sentence builders are going to help them to build up those chunks of vocab those chunks of information that will help them to create you know a really successful blog a really successful um email so when it comes then to um, the last of the techniques I want to look at this evening, this is the recycling and the, re the revisiting vocab. So I suppose, you know, in class, um, in the past, I used to be guilty of kind of, you know, saying, looking at my scheme of work and saying, OK, you know, les vacances, done. And then I'd move on to something else. That really was, I suppose, more helping keep me on track, but it wasn't really preparing my learners for um, their summit of assessments at all. So if we really want our learners to internalise this vocab, to commit it to their long term memory, we have to present our learners with opportunities to recycle and revisit previously learned words on a regular basis. And when I say that, I don't mean by just continually testing them on it. What we need to do is, for example, with recycling language, can we provide our learners with opportunities to use or to see the vocabulary they have previously learned in different contexts, in different settings, maybe asking them to use that language with a different language skill. Um, I love to use, you know, some very um, kind of age appropriate for junior cycle uh, news websites, Anjou 
of an act two. Once again, you know, you can't subscribe, but this what I use is, is all free. Um, they can, you know, access articles. They can also see the comments that people have written at uh, their age on the articles, which is something that they tend to love. Um, OCAP once again is for young French uh, kind of I suppose preteens and teens, which works perfectly for our first, second, and third. You know, listening to podcasts um, that are very much, you know, age appropriate, letting them hear the language that they have been learning. Um, when it comes to revisiting, so we want to help our learners' brains to form long-term memories of the vocabulary and the structures. So I suppose when it comes to this, you know, this is something that, you know, when we're preparing maybe for um, our, you know, we're thinking about our, our summit of exams, be it like the, the end of unit, the end of unit of learning test, or be it the, the house exams or the, the state exams. Um, I would always try to get the, the students involved. So, you know, if you are uh, in a school that is using iPads, I would say get them go low tech, you know, um, Students, um, I think nowadays, you know, they're seeing online, they're seeing the influencers keeping these beautiful copies, colour coded, uh, you know, a beautiful calligraphy, beautiful kind of bullet journals. Get them, you know, get them to kind of do the same. So I would often ask um, a class who would look at the different uh, units of learning and I would get them working in groups and I would say, OK, can you make up a set of flashcards or even just a uh, um, an A4 poster of the vocabulary, you know, maybe breaking it into the productive and the receptive, the must know and the must recognize, you know, getting them to do nice images, to color, to highlight. And um, I would either then display them around the class or I would photocopy them and make them into then a little revision uh, booklet. And um, another way, you know, if you don't have the tech in the classroom, you know, get the students to go on to Duolingo um, at home. Duolingo is naturally kind of what they love. They like kind of moving up through the levels as, you know, they're revising. Thing. The revision, the recycling is really built into the heart of Duolingo. That is really kind of how that language learning platform works. Um, so it's something that, you know, they can do at home. I don't really do it in class with them, but I would check in and say, you know, what are the badges we've been earning? What are the, you know, what's the progress that's happening? And then the last thing I suppose that I do is trying to bring in the assessment for learning. So I would often give the students um, learning homework as opposed to to written homework. I would try and make it manageable, maybe four or five uh, words to, to learn at a time. And then instead of just saying, well, learn those words, you know, over the, the, the two weeks of this um, unit of learning, and then I'll give you a big vocab test at the end. What I do instead is at the start of class, we have something called a mini quiz. I ask the learners, you know, I give them two minutes on the timer to revise their words from the previous evening or the previous week. Then I'll call the words out. And um, sometimes I'll call them out in English, sometimes I'll call them out in French, you know, to check their spelling or check their translation. And um, I also want the gender with them. It's all peer assessed. So we swap with the rest of, you know, with our partner, we swap with the people in the group. And um, I put up the words and then we, we correct them. So what I find is it's keeping them, you know, accountable. And um, if they're having you know, a problem then in the kind of larger tests, I'll say to them, well, you know, let's go back and look over at the mini quizzes. Sometimes, you know, I let them call them out or we'll do it on little whiteboards. But I find having that trace, you know, writing it down, it's 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 so, so important. It kind of helps them, I suppose, track their knowledge, track their learning. And then it's something that, you know, if there is a problem, I can kind of go back, open the copy and see, well, you know, we were great at the start of the month or great at the start of the term. But look, you know, we're kind of trailing off. So and that's then when I would kind of come back to them and maybe give them, you know, different ideas of, you know, how we can really revisit and recycle uh, the vocabulary. So there's the five. Um, as I say, I hope there's something um, useful um, in there. You know, it is a challenge teaching vocabulary, but when it comes to MFL, vocab is king, vocab is queen, you know, so we really have to invest in the techniques and the strategies that we are using um, with our learners. So I, as I say, you know, I really hope there's something that you can take from tonight's presentation and, you know, go and use it in class. I use it in class to tomorrow um, you know and just um, you know stick with it just you know keep it fun that's the the most important thing for our learners okay merci
Thank you so much, Dervla. That was really, really interesting and lots of really practical ideas, as you say, that that hopefully some of our uh, the teachers joining us this evening can go go forth tomorrow and use straight away. So that's brilliant. And um, Dervla also showed you some lovely features and examples there from Tues Ensemble. So just before we open up our Q&A session, which we're about to do, um, I'll take the opportunity just to remind everybody here that this year we are excited to offer teachers the flexibility of choice when it comes to uh, Tues Ensemble, our junior cycle French programme. You can look specifically at the unique needs and preferences of whether it's your school, your department, your, your students, the learners in your class, uh, your timetable, whatever it is, and you can decide which option suits you best. Is it Tues Ensemble 1 et 2, or is it the uh, Tues Ensemble Cours Complet, the single book option that covers the three years? And if you'd like to have a look at what the programmes have to offer, uh, just head over to folins.ie and you can have a look through the flipbook. I think Karan is putting a link to it in the chat if you want to click on that at some point. Um, and also, if you have any questions, you can reach out to your Folins rep. If you're not sure who that is, um, you can find that information by going on folins.ie as well. Um, so we will open up the floor to questions at this point now. I think probably the easiest way to do it is just to have them come in through the chat. So do pop your questions into the chat and I will keep an eye on those and I'll read them out to Dervla. We've got about just just about 10 minutes there, so that should be enough time for, for some for the questions. Um, while I'm giving you an opportunity just to to start putting your questions in there now. There was something that, that occurred to me, Darvla, as you were speaking. Um, you were talking about the, the, the TikTok generation, and obviously we are looking specifically here um, in terms of junior cycle and strategies that support that learner where they're maybe looking at 30 seconds is the attention span that you're working with. Do you find that that challenge is, is filtering through to senior cycle as well? Yeah, I mean, I suppose, um, you know, the reality is that, um, you know, the learners we had maybe like, say, five, you know, years ago, like we're, you know, they're kind of, you know, four or five years, they're, they're coming through to senior cycle. And, you know, I, I definitely see it. Uh, the biggest place I see it is really connected to um, literacy. So, you know, the um, Leaving Cert uh, French exam is, you know, it's a very formal exam, like the reading comprehensions. I find that students are increasingly struggling with the second reading comprehension, which is the literary reading comprehension um i know kind of if anyone there is a french and english teacher you're probably bemoaning just that you know the lack of students actually reading you know novels so i find that if the students are not really reading in English. It's very hard for them then to be reading these very formal texts in French. So yeah, it is something and that's why, you know, I really feel that, you know, we have to get the strategies, you know, to, to get them reading, like even if it's reading online, that is still, you know, reading. But yeah, it, it definitely is um, a challenge that our learners are, are changing. And, you know, the way I suppose we've captured that with it, the junior cycle exam, the way we're examining them, but certainly, yeah, with senior cycle, it is I find that, you know, in the past I could maybe have done like a, a 20, 30 minute grammar session. No, that that time is, you know, that's absolutely gone. So, um, yeah, it's just, I suppose, it, you know, keeps us on our toes as, as, as teachers. Um, and really, I suppose when it comes to digital, that is something that we absolutely have to now, um, you know, blend into into our learning. Definitely. That's interesting. Um, Bridie asks, are the two books exactly the same as the new book? So I'll start with a brief summary then, Dervla, and if you yeah. want to, to chime in with anything, um, what I would say is the structure and the features of both books, or both um, options, are the same. So it's the same thematic approach. We have the same, um, you know, the sentence builders still in every chapter, the Tash Clay, um, the um, activating prior knowledge, the approach is the same throughout. What we have essentially done is um, we've listened to feedback from teachers and we've listened to some of the challenges that that some teachers are experiencing in schools. And we've decided that the, the best thing to do is to give them the flexibility of choice. So um, some, for example, some of the dossier culture activities are no longer in the uh, cours complet in the combined book. Um, we still have a cultural uh, spread in every single chapter, but we have just reduced the, the overall volume of them and those are still available online. So even if you're getting the core complete, you have that available as a printable. So if you wanted to 
for example, give it to an early finisher or something like that. Or if you wanted to, to go a little bit deeper on a particular topic, you still have the option to do that. The, um, the devoir activities that were in the textbook for Tues Ensemble 1 and Tues Ensemble 2 are still available to you, but they are also online as a printable. So what essentially we've done is we've combined the two books so that if you would prefer to have a single book for your students, that option you know, it is now available to you. But the overall volume is slightly reduced just in terms of making it, if you were struggling to finish two books, make it a little bit more manageable. But you still have the option to do the two, to do the two ensemble uh, and two ensemble de, if if what you are prioritizing is the opportunity for practice, practice, you know, um, and and yeah. Darvla, is there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, to no, that? and I suppose just kind of, I suppose the kind of rationale behind it there, like you touched on, is that you know increasingly, um, you know, our kind of language classroom, you know, is changing. Like I am still on my maybe four 40 minute, you know, uh, contact hours for, for junior cycle. That gets reduced down, you know, a little bit in second year, comes back up in third year. I know that quite a few schools have gone to the hour period, which means you might only have, well, I'm not saying only, but you know, you have your, your two contact hours. Um, you know, realistically, there's a certain amount of work that the students are going to be able to take in, you know, during during that time. So, you know, some teachers would prefer to have the kind of uh, the uh, the kind of two in one so that the book is, you know, it's for the, the three years. It's the one book they lived, you know, bring to class. I know in some uh, classrooms they like to leave the books in the class. Um, but then I also know that there's teachers, you know, who who like to have, you know, the wide kind of variety of exercises there who like to be able to hop, you know, from the uh, dossier uh, culturel to, uh, you know, interesting work on la francophonie. So I suppose, you know, we've kind of created the, the best of, of both worlds and it's really about giving teachers you know more choice like just like our students are changing our teachers are also changing so you know I'm delighted that you know um, we are able to offer Toussaint Sambe as the kind of original two book package or then as the new uh, one three year book so really it's for what um, you know I would really urge teachers to um, you know see which one suits you the best the the I can definitely assure as um, Clodagh said that you know if what what is what was taken out of of the um uh the the one book you know that is online that is available it, it has not been lost it might just suit you better for yourself and your learners to to teach that way so really it's all about just providing more choice Um, lots of really positive feedback coming in, Dervla, in the chat just to say that it was really, really useful and they've got lots of really good ideas. Um, a couple of people asking about attendance certificates. Um, I, I think that is something that we can facilitate, but I think possibly you just email in. Um, Karan, maybe you might be able to put a link in the chat there um, and that can be organised offline. It's not something we do tonight, but yeah, I think that is an option. Um, thank you so much. OK, so we're coming up on the time. So we've actually done really well for time this evening. Thank you very much, Dervla. Um, I think it, all that remains for me now is just to say a huge thank you to you, Dervla, um, for leading our webinar this evening. It's been really interesting, really informative. And to thank everybody here present for attending, for joining us. And I hope you all enjoy what's left of your evening. Yeah.